This is a bit of an experiment, and I think it's fantastic that we've got so many of you here at such short notice. Um, I didn't know what to expect. Threw it out there less than two weeks ago. It probably helps that we've got a good guest speaker here tonight. Some of you know Dan Ryan. I met Dan about five years ago now, I think, because I'd been at Bob Tucker, who was president of the Liberal Party when I was vice president saying, we need a think tank on our side of the fence. Oh, yeah, 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 maybe. And um, then the next thing I know, he says, my wife plays bridge with this lady and she's been telling me I've got to meet her nephew. And it was Dan. Dan had just come back from Hong Kong, where he'd been, and I think at that stage, still was a director of the Lion Rock <coughs> Institute, which is a centre-right think tank in Hong Kong. And Dan being from North Queensland, had the Queensland chip on his shoulder really strongly and saying, we need to have a think tank in Queensland. So the combination of the two of us convinced Bob that maybe he should be the chair of it. So that's why we're all here tonight, in a sense, because of that. So Dan's been there at the beginning of what we've been doing. But to me, more bizarrely, he was there in Hong Kong with the Lion Rock Institute. Um, and you know how you go from Townsville to Hong Kong and the Lion Rock Institute and free market economics in um, the um, outpost of communist China, even though it's got independent governance, it's a bit beyond me. But anyway, uh, Dan's a corporate lawyer. He was there for 15 years, I think, um, I gather. Um, he um, does advice on commercial deals, particularly IP, which must be particularly tricky when you're dealing with Chinese, I'd imagine. Maybe Donald Trump should be talking to you. <laughs> um, he's, as I said, from North Queensland, which makes him a better Queenslander than most of us, uh, at least according to people from North Queensland. <laughs> uh, although, he did get his degree from the ANU. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> in any event... Let's go drinking. <laughs> Before we go drinking, I'd like to um, open up to Dan to talk about Hong Kong. Uh, well, thanks very much, Graham, for the kind introduction. Um, it's uh, it's good to be here. It's good to talk to you about. It. There's been a lot of interest, obviously, in Hong Kong in the last three months. Uh, I've given a lot of thought to it, and one of the things that occurred to me in the last couple of days was a passage that uh, the Conservative uh, columnist Peter Hitchens wrote in a, in a book of his about how, when he was a foreign reporter, and I think it was um, um, Somalia, he had witnessed a scene where there were policemen with white gloves directing traffic, and it was very civilised um, when he was there, and then he came back ten years afterwards, and suddenly it completely deteriorated, the social fabric had broken down. And he said that once you've seen something like that, um, you never look at us in this society in the same way again. And I distinctly remember uh, on the, the uh, MTR each day in Hong Kong, going to work and uh, listening to you know, BBC or, or some news service talking about you know, the breakdown of law and order in Syria and Iraq and thinking to myself you know, ponderously, geez, isn't it amazing how how civil society works in the MTR, even when people are uh, in a rush and when it's very crowded and they can sort of form orderly lines and, uh, and go to work on their way. And, you know, what, what actually, what's the nation that sort of keeps this together? And obviously in the last couple of weeks, the MTR has been at the centre of, of the protests that have gone on. They've enabled, really, what has happened. That's the tactical hit and run of the protesters with very sophisticated... Uh, social media technology, which I think actually will be quite influential globally, for good and for bad um, protests, depending on perspective, uh, and the way they, they implement things. The tactics will be adopted. But anyway, you've got to th so I ask myself, um, you know, how does this happen? How does this uh, civil order break down? Is it, uh, is it salvageable in Hong Kong? And what does it all mean? And one of the things I think that probably hasn't been covered as well, or understood as well in the public, is that, uh, and this is something I actually was discussing this afternoon on, on the ABC, it, it's that it's not 
not only is it not quite, not like 1989 in Beijing, it's actually, I think, should be understood much more the process of Hong Kong as a type of the populist movements that uh, have broken out in the United States, famously with Trump's election, with Brexit, um, Eastern <coughs> Europe, and the rest of it. In, the, in this sense, the protests, in my view, aren't driven so much by um, a desire for freedom, but a desire for the preservation of a particular identity. So it's not a Reagan-esque type of revolution where uh, the Eastern Europeans are throwing out Soviet rule or, or, or Beijing in 1989 where there was genuine you know, repression um, and, and people wanted greater freedom, it was what motivated them. In Hong Kong, in my analysis at least, it's much more to do with, it's a, it's a Trumpian style revolution in this sense, a Trumpian uprising, in that people want to make sure they preserve the ethnic or um, identity of Hong Kong, they want to protect um, their economic stability uh, and livelihood uh, from you know, direct competition from mainland China. Um, um, and they want to also, um, at some level, maintain the sovereignty, control over their own, um, over their own, over their own lives. And I think it's worth um, thinking about this because that's a microcosm for, you know, China, Hong Kong exists cheek by jowl with mainland China and they're directly exposed to mainland China economic, in economic terms uh, because they're broadly, you know, they're ethnic, they're Chinese, racially, I suppose you describe them as. There's a different language, um, you know, as mutually um, uh, unintelligible as Gaelic and English, um, but sharing the same characters, although even then there's, there's structural differences at, at times. Uh, and yeah, so bottom, bottom line, that's ultimately what I think has been driving it. And the other thing that has been, um, that the importance needs to be stressed is that it's partly to do with the dysfunctional way that Hong Kong has been set up. Um, you know, there have been, this isn't the first protest that have occurred, that has occurred since 1997 with the handover. And there were protests before that as well, under the British. Um, but the way Hong Kong is set up, you have uh, the Legislative Council, which is effectively like a mini, mini parliament, and then you have a chief executive who um, is the notionally the chief of the executive. And a third of the Legislative Council elected more or less directly, a third are appointed by Beijing, and a third are, in simplified terms, are members of sort of industry guilds. So you have, if you imagine the equivalent of, of Queensland being, I don't know, third of Brisbane being, uh, uh, Queensland state deputies being appointed by Canberra, um, a third being appointed, you know, the, the chairman of the ABC being elected, uh, the head of the Reset, Re, Real Estate Association, the governor, what else, you know, maybe head, think tank head might be in there as well. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, and then, and then, and then, and then uh, the, you know, so you have a situation where controversial issues are off. Uh, whether it's uh, implementing sort of new security laws, as happened under Tong Chi Hua, you know, and this was 2003, right? Where there was a, there's all, with all these things, the genuine, there's a reasonable argument to make. I mean, it's 2003, Patriot Act was being introduced in the United States. In Australia, we were introducing, you know, greater security, national security related, related laws. But because they can't go to the electorate and say, this is what the, the program we're going to implement, please back us. They never get a genuine uh, democratic mandate. And so, you know, with all the different controversies and policies that arise in any society, you know, carbon taxes, stop the birds, all the rest of it that, that promotes the headlines, <coughs> unless you can kind of flush that out <coughs> through, through an election of, um, of, of some sort, it never clears. Um, and it doesn't mean you don't have to, you don't have to you know, accept or, or agree that the 50% of the population have it right, but at least it, it, it means that the executive can act um, and, and, and make an argument that, look, I've got the people with me on this one. Um, and in Hong Kong, you just don't have that. So you had a series of chief executives, Tong Chi Hua, um, uh, John Sam, sorry, not John Sam, um, Donald Sam, and then um, and then Siwa Long, and now Carrie, Carrie Lam. And, uh, you know, Carrie Lam, She's no tyrant. I mean, she's a she's a middling, um, fairly upright, um, well, not very upright, um, 
Of the, of, of, of the type of the type that you know the British um, at their best produced and sort of nurtured through civil civil uh, the civil service, and yet she sort of because she she's not a politician she's never had to go to the electorate really only less than I mean depending on how you cut it less than a fifth of the population of Hong Kong have an indirect vote for for, for Kerry um, Lam. Um, and so, uh, and not only does she have the mandate, she just doesn't have the executive authority or gravitas to be able to kind of um, explain to people that this is this is difficult and necessary um, piece of legislation that we might want to enact. Um, and as a result, you get this. You know, she's no. I was the same the other day. You know, Carrie Lam is no Sir Joe. <laughs> you, know, you, you can see people don't take her seriously in that sense. And then you have this recording that came out the other day, which was sort of half apologetic, um, and that just is the worst of all possible worlds because you're saying something different to what you're saying in public. You're demonstrating weakness, and you don't actually believe in what you're saying. Uh, and you don't explain properly some of the key aspects of it. I mean, there's been this clamour for the withdrawal of the extradition bill. Um, and, and even with that, I mean, there's a, there's a reasonable argument to make. There needs to be some type of arrangement, um, not with mainland China, but with other people. And it was basically introduced because there was a Taiwanese um, guy, resident in Hong Kong, who admitted to murdering his girlfriend in Taiwan. But because, for complicated reasons, Taiwan's not recognised as part of mainland China, um, they couldn't, there was no arrangements to get that guy out of there to, to Taiwan to face justice. You've got a murderer, in, a murderer in, in Hong Kong, and they've got no real mechanism for, for getting rid of him and extra, extraditing him to Taiwan. And um, the compromise that came up, which is classic sort of fudge, was, okay, well, we have these extradition treaties, ones with Australia and you know, other parts of South Africa, I believe. It's a whole stack that Hong Kong has. They don't want mainland China. But we'll have a situation where, where, with those countries where we don't have a formal extradition treaty, the, the chief executive will be able to you know, make arrangements and we'll put these safeguards in, in place to, in theory, allow in certain you know, circumstances, allow that extradition of the criminal to occur. But obviously people think, well, no, well, you know, this is going to put pressure on um, people in Hong Kong. There's all, will always be hanging over us like the sort of Damocles that we may have infringed some PRC law um, and they might be using the threat of you know, tax evasion. I mean, there'll be a stack of tax evaders in Hong Kong. <laughs> the I would like to say that actually, when, when you, not only in, in Hong Kong, but in the different parts of China where they hear speak different Chinese dialects, whenever someone hears the word, hears like standard Mandarin, they, it's like the, it's like the tax collector speaking. <laughs> it's, almost, it's, almost, it's almost as though it's, this has the same reaction for. You know, there's a reason why they, they give you know, Scar and the Lion King a very you know, tony British accent. It has that same type of reaction. It sort of climbs up and thinks, oh my god, I'm after, after my loot. So, um, you know, in, in broad brush terms, that is the, how it has developed. Um, they, the latest news, which I'm sure you're following, maybe even more up to date, is that she has said now she is going to formally withdraw um, the legislation. The problem, which she didn't explain, is that LegCo actually has to reconvene in the same way as Australia. You have a, a bill which has passed its first reading. The parliament has to reconvene to formally withdraw that. So LegCo last sat on the 26th of um, June, and then the protests where they came in and, and you know, basically roughed up the place. And then they suspended LegCo hearings <coughs> until September. So unless they bring that forward, I still think they're not going to formally be able to withdraw the bill. I think they basically want to, and I think they've realised what a complete disaster it is, but they, she hasn't properly explained the process, and as a result, you know, people are justifiably um, suspicious. There are, you know, I, I think tactically, there was definitely a massive wave of support for the fir first um, protesters against the extradition bill. Then there was, when she said it was dead and made a few concessions, there was a little bit of a lull, and then there was further protest, and then what really inflamed things was that scene, I think it was telecast here in Australia, of, of some triadic type goons in the New Territory beating up um, some protesters, uh, some pro, pro, you know, anti-extradition bill protesters, and then, um, then a kind of lackadaisical response from the police force, the Hong Kong police, who, who genuinely have a, a reputation for being fairly upright and, and uh, you know, well-ordered um, types. And that inflamed things, and you have this sophistication um, 
you know, process system where people were effectively up using Telegram and um, another program that I wasn't aware of but allows you to communicate via Bluetooth and sort of virtual networks and effectively voting, upvoting on the things that they'd like to do today. So, like, you, you push it up and you, people make suggestions about what would be the most effective protest we think we could do today. And there'd be votes on that. And then through the MTR, they basically get out there and do it. So it was really quite um, a decentralised, you know, blockchain type of um, protest. Um, well, we could learn from There you go. <laughs> well, 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 I think many people will. Um, a very technically savvy Hong Kong guys. A lot of, you know, the Hong Kong students and other people were involved. And then you have... Um, blue collar types, I guess, in the, in the new territories. Anyway, so how is it all going to end? I think basically you're going to get now, the social fabric has been frayed, I think you will gradually get a dying down of it to some extent, as, as Carrie Lam, you know, and the political class accede to some of the demands. I don't think they're going to be able to agree to the, the famous five um, requests that the um, protesters have made, which are, let me get them right, Carrie Lam step down, universal suffrage, the, the protesters that was originally held to be not characterised as a quote unquote riot, amnesty for the um, any the protesters involved in it, and there's one more. Free elections. Well, that was the you know, suffrage. Yeah, right. Anyway, there's the independent there's more, investigations. More, independent investigation, bingo, yeah. And so they'll get, I think they'll get a fair amount of those. That, you know, then there'll be debate about what precisely constitutes that independent investigation, whether there should be international people involved there. I mean, that needs to happen clearly, right? Um, it does need to be, for reasons I described, gradual uh, changes to the democratic structure of Hong Kong, <coughs> so that you do, so people can, you know, TV executives can make decisions on things. Um, but um, they're never going to get, in my view, um, full the ability for uh, one man, one, one woman, one vote directly elect your representatives in a And the issue is, uh, <laughs> you know, it's sort of always with reading different things other than the, the kind of uh, current fair. I was reading, um, as it happens, a book by a, a, national, a, a author from National Review called Michael Brennan Doherty. It's a book called uh, My Father Gave Me Island. Autobiographically, talks about how effectively um, he, you know, his father deserved him, but then he kind of um, understood over time the importance of the nation state, and it goes into the, the history of the revolution in Ireland at that stage, which was a province and then became a nation. We had a high degree of autonomy, and then it kind of like decided that it was a separate people, um, uh, and you know, to great controversy and up, political upheaval and the rest of the time. And obviously, not all analogies are, are perfect, and that one doesn't really work. But you can sort of see what was going what was going on. There are some parallels. You know, you had a situation which is like quite repressed. They're not quite repressed on Kong. I mean, tomorrow, if, if it all died down completely. The Lion Rock Institute holding a gala, we hold a gala ball every year celebrating um, Hong Kong's freest academy, being the most free economy in the world. It's still going to be the most free economy in the world. Um, in, in, um, it's not, it is right now. We have you know, greater taxes are lower. And, you know, it's still, it's still, it's still, I still think it's, it's overplayed the fact the infringement on the rule of law in Hong Kong. I still think you, you go to those courts, there's Australian judges, there's um, very um, serious um, local judges that you can't immediately detect. Um, you know, if you're doing a civil case or, a, or an IP case or a corporate case, and the, the, the standard of, of, of justice there is very high. Um, the, the press does exist there. I mean, the reason why this thing is so well covered is because you've got the, you know, the headquarters of the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal in Hong Kong, you've got a massive Cantonese and English press. The reason, far more so than in a place like Singapore, where the Wall Street Journal can't operate because they're you know, sued. And, you know, Singapore is less, you know, like less democratic than Hong Kong in some ways, but for reasons that I was explaining earlier, at least those guys, they are their own little city-state. They're autonomous. They have their own sovereignty. The society comes in, and they're also not directly in direct competition with you know, the Indonesians and Malaysians around them. It's not, they don't, not, haven't quite experienced the, the brutal gales of competition in the way that... Hong Kong people have. You know, the mainlanders who used to be these country bumpkins have now you know, become very you know, English speaking, highly skilled. Um, they come down, they buy real estate, they buy um, you know, competing directly with business opportunities in the professional services sphere uh, and in a whole lot of other spheres. And if you're a blue collar worker as well, you've got sort of, you know, you've had seen a lot of stuff being outsourced across the border. So there's just this pressures that be put on that unique 
on that unique city state. And I've had, I've had conversations with old wine rock buddies who are pretty you know, libertarian ex, and they're like, you know, well, we really should build a wall to stop quite the influx of mainlanders across. It's, it's interesting that the, how the political mood has changed in many ways. So look, that's, that's it in a broad brush way. Um, I've only focused on Hong Kong. I, mean, I always feel like a, a little bit of an interlope because mainland China is, is more my thing. But um, if anyone has any questions or you want to talk about um, more of a particular subject, we go, go, go right ahead. We'll have more than someone. You, don't remember. Uh, you talked about the techniques that were being used by the protesters mm. and their applicability in their places. You mentioned things like a telegram. Yeah. There's been oh, some. Can everyone hear? No, no. no. Why, don't just, why don't you stand up and tell those? Stand up and tell them what you think, and they'll test his ears. Ah, oh, I don't know about what I think, but you well, what would you like to know? Well, you talked about the um, like the techniques that were being used by the protesters and their applicability <coughs> elsewhere. Um, services like Telegram, in particular, you mentioned, or I think Dropbox was something. Bridgely is another one. Oh, Bridgely. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's been some debate about whether or not that's like been secured, whether or not there has been infiltration or it's been hacked or whatever. Um, but do you think that those services are still in use? Do you think that they're going to be the services that are used elsewhere? Uh, you talked about blockchain a bit. Um, do you think that that's going to see more use in terms of future processes? Because, you know, back in the Arab Spring, it was Facebook that was the big thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think the answer is there will be then that latest and greatest thing will be used to, in, in different mm -hmm. projects going forward. It's just interesting that they are genuinely making use of the most cutting edge um, social and communication technology to implement the thing. And the police have got smarter. I mean, they have been able to tap into um, some of these networks. And their tactics have improved as well. I mean, they've been able to, I mentioned the MTR, the group in the talk. That enabled the protests to, to just buzz around Hong Kong you know, pretty quickly and swarm in particular places. But the police, um, over time, worked out, okay, we shut down the MTR, we, we shut down the capacity to, to do um, hit and run type um, activities. And they have, got, um, they have got smarter about it, and they have got, you know, everyone's adjusting all the time to the tactics of the other side. So have they shut down the MTR? No, they've just had people screening. They've, they've had um, a, a police presence on many of the key um, subway stations. You wonder what they would Well, they would have. Why would they shut down? Oh, because of the whole city was shut down. It's oh. very hard to get around, if you're, if you're, like, mm -hmm. especially in the middle of summer. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Hong Kong wouldn't function if you, if you didn't have an MTR. Um, mm -hmm. um, it's very, very hard. You get, you get gridlock traffic as well, more so than you do. Um, one of the reasons I'm here tonight, apart you know, from dragging my wife out on date night, uh, <laughs> AIP events are always great. And is the reason model for all of you is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to Hong Kong on the 24th for a, for a conference. Um, and the last time I was there it was a rugby trip when the Brits still had it. So, um, what's the likelihood that it's going to be um, disruptive? Uh, from this point on, or you think it's plateaued, and the other... Uh, you just question. want a traffic forecast. <laughs> <laughs> I do. And, and do you have some sort of um, sympathy for the Chinese government? Because it's a bit of a wicked problem for them with that whole, you know, one country, two systems thing that they're having to manage, you know, Hong Kong sitting over here, <coughs> over, just over a set of lines. I don't know about that sympathy for them. No, I think that the, um, the, the weird thing about Hong Kong is that have these protests and it looks quite dramatic on TV and the next day you go there and the streets are clean and people have a lunch as though it's the rock concert the night before almost. Um, so I, and there has been, despite the dramatic footage, and it's a dramatic city, so you know, it goes on and looks, you know, this what has there really been? The police have not shot anyone. Um, I was chatting to Ron Manners, who's a mutual friend the other day, he was in discussion, he was telling me like, he had this um, exchange student from Ukraine, and then went back and he was in the heart of the the conflict between Ukraine and the uh, and the Russians, and they were getting 70 students shot a day. <laughs> she was crying and typing that. So nothing like that has happened. Um, there haven't. There's been a few Molotov cocktail bodies that have been thrown. There's been defacement of things, a bit of vandalism, but and there's been some you know beatings by the police of, of protesters. But still, uh, and there's been some, they, there have been some deaths, but there've been suicides and accidents. They haven't. I don't think anyone's really disputing that. And there's been some injuries, you know, famously the, the girl with her eye 
um, her, but it still there still is a certain degree of restraint on both sides. You're not getting, you know, um, like the troubles in Northern Ireland, you know, bombs being let off in, in subways. I mean, all this stuff could in theory happen. You know, the um, if, if it was really kind of, you know, it was really serious, really, really serious, right? It, there's still a certain, there's still sort of rules of the game which people are playing by. Hong Kong is disarmed. I mean, there's no one, no one in theory has guns in Hong Kong. Um, it's one of the least um, cities apart from the police um, on the planet. Um, I don't actually think that there's any, like, I, I just can't see what the, the army would actually add. The PRC government, they, they decided to send troops across. What they what they could do, the police couldn't do, apart from probably secure the airport. But we, you know, if those crazy um, climate um, people in, in town decided to disrupt the airport and shut down, doesn't you know, eventually the police couldn't handle. Well, hey, we, we, you know, we call the Chinese, or probably <laughs> some, some, somebody, somebody <laughs> help me to, to, to make sure it make sure it all work because at some point you do have to just well, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, you had yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, one recalls, or well, some of us do anyway, the Vietnam War. Uh, post the Vietnam War, it wasn't about communism, it was about nationalism. Mm -hmm. Do you consider then the, the mainland China and Hong Kong to look upon it as nationalism? So that they, I mean, uh, Vietnam is a very safe country, economically very strong, and as far as, in, and a, a probably a future growth area as far as in, uh, of, of the standards of education, you can see the number of Vietnamese here. But uh, I just wonder whether China could adopt something similar, it's a, it's a, a national issue and not communism and an issue about that. And so then there's peace as far as, I mean, I mean there's 100,000 expats who live in Hong Kong, as far as, and, uh, and I assume they'll be staying there, although they could move to Vietnam, but I'm not sure. What are your views of the possible compromise that uh, mainland China could consider a model that uh, it's more about nationalism rather than Well, um, I mean, I think the chances of like the PLA driving into Hong Kong and nationalizing like HSBC in the name of the proletariat, um, um, I think they would be, um, but they want to control Hong Kong. They, they consider it, it is part of China. I mean, Margaret Thatcher, no you know, socialist, signed the joint declaration to, um, to see the new territories and then Hong Kong Island to, that's part of the to Beijing, uh, yeah, and then, um, but then, so, and the Hong Kongese are in this halfway house, like they neither, you know, I, I, I think that they genuinely are in two minds, so there's surveys that put out, do you feel Hong Kongese or do you feel Chinese, and they, they, there's a big surge in Hong Kong, people identifying as Hong Kongese, but would they actually feel that there are separate people in the same way? Use my other analogy: the Irish felt different to the, to the um, British. I mean, mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're different, but they're different enough to be their own their own thing. And I, I think because of, I think that that's where you really get kind of serious conflict. If, if Hong Kong was to say we want to be an independent nation state, I think that, because it, it, quite apart from anything else, it's an example for any other of the different. Um, Cities around China who are also distinctive in their ways. You think Chongqing Rebel or you know, Wenzhou Rebel or you know, Xi'an all these places. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think it's in Beijing's interest to, to their, their long term goal is to make everyone, you know, loved the motherland and be all Chinese, including Taiwanese and maybe a few other people, you know, ever expanding zone. As long um, as we're in uh, charge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so that, that's, I think that's their primary driver. And yes, they have particular antipathies to you know, you know, um, human rights because of their um, Marxist you know, background. But it's not a revolutionary Marxist state at the moment. But it's still you know, bad news. In some ways, it's, you know, it's, I would say, has our China policy really been that great? <coughs> According to what metrics? 30 years ago, you know, it was four, more, four years ago, and now it's time it was a in the revolutionary state, yes, they had nukes, but they wouldn't have, couldn't have really hit Australia. Yeah. Um, but now they've got, they've got, you know, they're not like that, they're not cultural revolution, but they, you know, well armed, thousand kilometres south from the China Sea, great air bases, great, you know, modernising new navy and air force and you know everything else. So, for military terms, we're better or worse off. Well, I think like they're a bigger threat than they were. This is uh, what's that? Everything's fine. Don't yeah. worry. Yeah. Um, yeah. So only, Hillary, only 30 million dead of their own people. That's yeah. Right. No, no, that, that, well, that's right. But I'm talking about in terms of Australia. Um, 
where we sit, and secondly, in terms of like, are we influencing them or are they influencing us? Which which Chinese ex senior politicians, or Chinese do you know that have then joined Australia for promotion of Australian think tanks or um, uh, who have you know, if I ex <laughs> no, 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 but I'm just it's a bald fact. It's a bald fact. How many LV bags are you talking? How many, how, how many, how many ex uh, Chinese ambassadors to Australia have then jumped off and established their own consulting outfit in Canberra, advising you know Australian investors in China? It's, it's, so, and then you've got, um, and then this goes situation was well, yes, it's been it's been good economically for Australia, but why? What, if that's been, been so great, why are we we have a massive national debt, you know, persistent unemployment, low growth, and then it's been kind of carving out of many industries, apart from the ones that don't go anywhere like mining and um, resources, mining and real estate and, you know, banking and what have. So, I don't know, you know, I think there does need to be a kind of reassessment of things. Um, so, yeah, John, you've got a question, I was just, I was just wondering, <laughs> oh, just, <laughs> 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 it's probably the seven o'clock the House of Lords rewritten. That's right, okay. yeah. um, People watching this from the distance of Taiwan, are they going to learn English? Oh. Mm. You're not watching this talk. I mean, people watch it. From home. So, <laughs> but they're back there and they're watching. There's an impression that China has to go a little bit softer on Hong Kong because they need to use Hong Kong as the proof to Taiwan that they can, you know, join home yeah, again. Well, so, it's, Taiwan would be watching what's going on here and learning lessons for what they should do next. Not a great, yes. Yeah, so obviously, it's not going to make a favorable impression on Taiwanese. All of this. I do think also though that people want to, like, Beijing in their in their heart of hearts. Um, uh, Think that you know democratic societies lead to chaos. You know, they kind of genuinely believe that. They don't think this. Um, well, yeah, you know, and, and so you don't want an example of, 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 or civil society, two free civil societies essentially to, to, to one chaos, right? So then you don't have a situation where Hong Kong, which was quite free, does actually descend and become a you know, issue, but as I mentioned in the beginning. So it's sort of an interest. I think it was tactical mistake to overly demonize the police in Hong Kong. You wanted to sort of win them over with bouquets, a bit more Gandhi-ish, rather than sort of IRA. I mean, not that they haven't gone that far, but that's, I think tactically it could have worked out slightly differently. But yeah, like I said, it still is, despite the hoopla and the uh, dramatic footage, there is still um, hope for a peaceful sort of dying down of it all, um, because there has been a strain and there hasn't, but if there were to be like, you know, shots and you know, people killed and genuine bloodshed on the street, blah, 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 you know, then take a long time to repair that kind of damage. So China's uh, national day is less than a month away now. Yeah. Um, Come on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, moon cakes and everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, and obviously a lot of people have linked the formal withdrawal of the bill as like a, a last ditch effort in order to get the protests mm. for October 1st. Do you think that um, people are going to start to pull back now that they know that they're approaching that point of um, where Beijing might feel the need to take a very aggressive stance, or do you think that this is going to end really badly? I think you'll get protests, big protests on, on October 1st and this coming weekend, um, basically pushing the kind of hashtag to the late line. Um, I think after that then, there might be, especially if there's further, some further concessions, you might gradually get to the things to wind up. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard, to, hard, hard to completely work it out. I think you'll get some basically low-level civil unrest in Hong Kong for, for a fair amount of time, and, and eventually gradual concessions, further concessions will be made until we reach that lovely year, 2047, when um, the, the guarantee that the quote-unquote capital system and way of life guarantee that we have a basic law um, will only be maintained 50 years, and then who knows what precisely will happen or what it even means when that um, expires. So um, you know, maybe by that stage, Hong Kong will be a little of just another, I mean, always talk about being a just another mainland China city. Um, maybe China, or you know, there'll be some other changes in China which make it less of an issue. I don't know, it's, it's hard, it's not long I actually, <clears throat> as it happens, was in Hong Kong over the weekend, I'd actually gone over to do some recording for uh, Hugh Lum, um, because he wrote a very interesting book back in 1964 and 65. And my experience is where there was an incredibly well-managed protest. I was wandering around the city 
and you'd see in the distance the protesters pop up and almost clean up after themselves instantaneously. Uh, and it was quite fascinating. Um, and at night time when I was watching the TV, I was surprised at the violence that I was seeing on the TV because I didn't actually see it on the streets. Um, but I did feel very unnerved when I saw some of the police trotting around with machine guns. I mean, that did unnerve me a bit. Um, and when I was, I'd gone to film The Peak, uh, which is part of the book, and I was also tried to film in front of the former governor's mansion. And the police, I mean, if there wasn't 500 police around this two acre block of, uh, of, of land, I'd, I'd go eat. Um, it was, so they were, the police were very serious, uh, very intent on squashing the protest. Um, I, my feeling is that I think you know, 18 months, two years, I reckon mainland Chinese have been marching in. I can't see it sorting itself out. I just think it's too frayed. You know, the democratic requirements versus what you can see the mainland Chinese want out of it. I just I can't see a, a, a sensible resolution. Hong Kong, Hong Kong benefits. Mainland China benefits a lot from Hong Kong. They're very serious. It's capital raising, offshore capital raising centre for mainland China. So it is in their interest to keep that, that going. But they don't, you know, they want it to be kind of in their box, a useful tool for their own interest. I think probably how they see things. I, I don't know. I mean, they might come to that. Like there's a bunch of in the streets. You know, God knows. You know, and they need to be a heavy hand. To restore or whatever, maybe that would happen, but it would not be, yeah. Um, and I don't think, they want to sort of bluster and, and do their parades in Shenzhen as a bit of an indication to sort of make people aware that it's serious, but I think it would take a lot, yeah, before. And I don't even think Tiananmen would be that great in Hong Kong. Because, you, you know, central is not Tiananmen Square, there's no large boulevards. It's a very confined thing. I don't think you struggle to get a tank in there, um, down the narrow streets, and then what do you do? You trace people down the alleyways. I mean, it'd be... Uh, and as we all know, Asians Just one quick question. Do you know what? Uh, what of the seven million people, how many hold another visa? That's number one question. Number two is, it's a commercial stamp. How do the, do you, have you got a feel for how the businesses of Hong Kong are, are, are sort of manoeuvring in this? What, what about their staff? Do they approve that their staff go to the streets? I, mean, I know it's on the weekends, a lot of it, but. How are the business guys trying to sort of manage this? Well, well telling the to people, they say that you don't ask people about whether they're attending the protest in the weekend in the office, because it is very, yeah, really, it is very divisive. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that they have been, I mean, there were, I've seen photos and anecdotally as well. Too. Anecdotally as well, um, <coughs> places that I know very well all shut down, um, because during on a weekday, which is usually very um, active in terms of commercial activity. <coughs> so. Um, there's definitely been an economic impact. Um, you know, Hong Kong's had a lot of... Um, Ron Manners, uh, he has a great line, says Hong Kong and Kalgoorlie are... Uh, Hong Kong's the only other place apart from Kalgoorlie that's not a crybaby town. So <laughs> there's all sorts of, like, you dust yourself off at the main street in Kalgoorlie after you've lost all your dough and you come back again. There is that spirit there that still exists. Mm -hmm. It's just, um, I think they liked it better than Hong Kongs when, Hong Kongies, when they were the only kind of guys doing it. And they've got these, you know, <coughs> mainland Chinese were coming in and being the top dog and swanning over and, and being at one booth and not really kind of appreciating the special place Hong Kong has in their hearts. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Um, but in all of this, though, we can't be too um, dewy on it. It isn't as if there was a perfect democracy yeah. under the Brits. Like, not, no. not a hell of a lot has changed. It was a protector of the Brits. You had Chris Patton, who was the last um, no. um, governor of Hong Kong, who was basically the same powers as the chief executive. So it, are we harking back to, to a golden age of democracy in Hong Kong which wasn't even there? Yeah. Oh, no, no, without a doubt, then there, there were. But uh, what had a, like, I, do, I do think this is where it's come. And it's not, um, the Brits, you know, they did genuinely foster civil society in Hong Kong. I remember the very first time I went to Hong Kong, it was for the quarter hand over in 97, and I remember crossing that border, I was in mainland China, across the border, and there were all these mainlanders, you know, um, bumping, sort of, you know, hustling in to get their passport stamped or whatever, and the, and the, and the Cantonese lady was, and she's like, this, is, this isn't China, you have to queue up, 
And you know that that doesn't come from, from anywhere. Um, and and so the um, you know that, that's that's not nothing. And I think that the you know, civil society, rule of law, you know, low taxation, or whatever else is what built that place. Um, but beneath it all, too, there's been you know people grow. Um, there's they have a, they, their identity becomes more important to them, especially with conflicting you know, external. You know, they appreciate more what the uniqueness of what they've got, and then and yeah, there has to be some way of, of flushing through these controversial issues that, that, that cross the, the government's desk from time to time in a better way. Um, and, and they probably did it better under the Brits, but it was again they were the, they were, they wouldn't have mainland China to compete against back in those days. Really. I mean, they had it was them. Um, and interestingly, the Brits were like they basically just went back to London, everything. East of sewers that hacked up and left, except Hong Kong, which they held on to until 1997. And so it was important for a whole lot of reasons. It was important international, it still is a very important international financial commercial center, global. Um, so um, it's just that the, <laughs> the Line Rock guys in Hong Kong, they're always like, well, look, maybe the guy that should be queuing at the American embassy and protesting the, uh, the policies of the Federal Reserve. Because the, the, the interface in Hong Kong because of the link to the Hong Kong oil with the US dollar. You know, all this property price explosion, I mean, it's, it used to be better than that in Jack Yellen. I mean, you know, it's down, it's, you know, it's a fair. I mean, it's, it has had a major impact. They don't have any control over that. We don't have any control over um, monetary policy. Fiscal policy does monetary policy. No, that's true. So that's, that's, you know, ruled by unelected bureaucrats. We can't elect. Can, um, can I um, yeah. follow up on that? Yep. Yeah. If you've got a really small government sector, which I have in Hong Kong, does democracy matter that much? Like, if the government's not telling you what to do too often, do you care as long as they leave you alone? Uh, well, you care if they try and introduce things. Has, has that been the secret of Hong Kong? Because under the British. Oh, well, that famously, the, the John Copperthwaite was the, was the British administrator who invented the, the, the slogan positive non interventionism. That was the, the slogan of Hong Kong um, government for a long period of time. You know, we're not going to. You know, we're not going to. Intervene unnecessarily, we're going to only do so in very rare circumstances. And he has these great stories where they were going to build a highway, and, um, and John Cobbett Wade didn't trust the, the planners, and so he went up himself to the top of the mountain and counted the number of cars going through and said, you know, that, that these stats are lies, um, you know, we don't actually need to do it on that basis. It was a, it was a you, know, um, uh, you know, Scottish uh, guy, quite. I think, <laughs> um, and, 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 and that, yeah, yeah that, was, that, that was the spirit of the place, but it, has, it doesn't matter until it matters. And, and actually, on a broader kind of note, sort of in free, free market circles, think tanks, everyone was like, you know, if only, and if only you know, Australia could be like Hong Kong, if US could be like Hong Kong, the world would be a better place. But the thing is, the problem with these city states are, like Townsville, like Hong Kong, yeah. um, they. Um, you know, they exist sort of at the mercy of bigger geopolitical power. They sort of float along in the geopolitical order. They don't really shape it. And so it's sort of, you know, I, I at least have sort of thought to myself more about whether, you know, how this and other episodes is illustrated that, that kind of um, shortcomings in making the world, everyone in Hong Kong, you know, place just quite like that way. Just That's a comment as far as, in, uh, mainland China has a probably slightly in excess of 400 companies that invest in the stock market and that's valued at probably in excess of 600 trillion US dollars. So it's significant. I mean, the mainland China, why would they ruin their own economy in mainland China? Oh, no, exactly. I, I genuinely don't think that people are like that Xi Jinping or whomever is harboring an interest in like, oh, only we can get in there and seize the loot if, if, we, if it wouldn't be cause us an international backlash or get away with it. I don't quite think that's the the thinking. Um, it's like I said, they want, little, they want Hong Kong to be a useful tool for their greater interests and they don't want um, they, they want Hong Kong to be you know, ever close to you. So is cultural matters driving this? You know, we've had this like in New South Wales recently he's been involved in this um, Aldi bag and he topped himself because he was a leader in the Chinese community in New South Wales, and here he was going to be exposed before a 
a commission of inquiry, so he's topped himself. Here in China, in in, in Hong Kong, we've looks like they've got a a um, well, what do you what do you want to call it a um, Can't, I can't get the word. A, uh, they're get going against the what the uh, the mainland Chinese want, and these guys they're despots. They're not commos anymore. They're just despots. They they're in control, and they want to maintain their control. Is that really where we're at? They don't want to lose face in in the fact that they still want to maintain control. Is really that the nub of the issue that's happening? I think I genuinely think that they, that they kind of wish this never occurred. This whole yeah, controversy. Yeah, yeah. It, clearly, there weren't. There wasn't necessarily like a plan that kind of that they that they wanted to cause unrest. Um, but uh, and I think they genuinely do think that we just want to get go things back to the way they were. And over time, Hong Kong will gradually be absorbed both in spirit and in practice into the mainland. By the so by the time we get to 2047 might be the biggest deal in the world, and then we'll all be patriotic, you know, unified, you know, um, European, <laughs> um, Chinese, yeah. sorry, you know. And diversity state. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, is it possible that this is part of a larger uh, issue when you've got the US-China trade wars, uh, and uh, if we are... The protesters, I, I'm not sure that you can say that Extinction Rebellion and the Hong Kong protesters are really engaging in the same activity. The, no, no. the, the, the intention, the motivation, uh, citizens here have a vote as to what needs to the issues that um, the protesters here engage in. Uh, but something like an extradition bill, and I appreciate that there was, you know, a murder, and that sounds um, quite horrific. But the fact that a, a Hong Kong citizen um, could be extradited to a country whose uh, whose judges are not, I don't, um, I, I don't understand, have are of the same caliber as you as you spoke of Hong Kong. Mm of the Hong Kong judiciary, is it, is it possible that this is part of a, a larger um, back and forth between the, the interests of, between democracy and, and yeah. other systems yeah. of government? And doesn't that go back to, you know, our ancient Greek? Um, uh, these are really long, mm. uh, long ancient ideas. and. If Hong Kong protesters don't do what they do, who will? Yes, look, I'm, just, just to be completely clear, I'm generally pro the Hong Kong protests, the general sort of motivations and stuff, because and I'm generally anti the extradition bill. I'm just explaining that with all of everything, there's a kind of reasonable argument to make. At least it's not kind of, it's not completely black and white. I mean, you could have some, you know, there's, there's always a reasonable argument. And I also think that, yeah, there's no real um, equivalence between the Hong Kong protesters and the, and the, and the, and the Hong Kong Solons that would have uh, extinction. Um, <laughs> um, I, I, I'm just, I was just comparing the tactics. I think the Hong Kong tactics will be adopted. But I also do think that um, uh, there's, um, you know, um, it wasn't democratic under the Brits. Uh, it's more democratic than it was then. It, but, but, but basically there's been a, a heightened, over time, heightened sense of the identity of, of Hong Kong, the importance of self-government in Hong Kong, which is why they, they've been unsatisfied, increasingly unsatisfied with the status quo, especially considering the challenges, the you know, competitive economic challenges that come, come down from mainland China. Um, is it a kind of broader question about whether the future is um, should be democratically ruled or, or, or ruled by technocrats? I mean, it's an interesting one. I think there's certainly like a, an increasing tendency amongst uh, Western elites to think that those nasty, you know, people they've got no idea. And it'd, it'd be better if the whole thing was run by you know, European style, <laughs> EU technocrats in the same way that you know Beijing thinks the same way. 
So, um, yeah, I think it does. I mean, the, 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 the mentality, you know, Xi Jinping goes to, who did tell before? I went to Europe and, and the old, like, Portuguese communists and who are now esteemed members of the European <coughs> Commission and, and God knows what else are all like, you know, cut, 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 socialism, blah, blah, blah. You know, so the, the, the mentality isn't completely different. I mean, there, there, there's a different historical and cultural background, there's assumptions and stuff. <coughs> but yeah, I get your point. Like, you know, it is, it is important that ultimately, um, you know, there's a democratic um, you know, uh, voice in decision making pattern of, of um, government, and the and yet there's a little bit of a balance to be had between what you know. This obviously you don't get to vote on every single issue. There's you know, delegation of authorities and, and what have so, and you don't want to complete the things. You know, we've seen in places like Iraq and stuff. You can't just drop democracy into the desert and hope for it and see, make it bloom. Uh, Hong Kong's people are highly educated, richer than Australians. They're capable of self-government. Um, obviously, um, so they could be a democratic country. It's, a, it's just that, or they could be a, so the democratic city state in the same way as Singapore, bigger than Singapore, it's just that happened right next door to China. And you know, you have to sometimes uh, you know, you know, realize the reality as well. Sorry, go on. Okay. Yeah. I think we've got one question yeah. over here, and then we probably should uh, yeah. call yeah. the questions. People can talk to you yeah. afterwards. We've still got more wine here. So <laughs> uh, and, and there's the uh, uh, yeah. what Lord, Lord of the Rings. <laughs> the Liberty on the Rock. There's <laughs> <laughs> a deliberate confusion there, I'm sure. Um, uh, up the road where you can get a free drink, but you've already paid for the drink here. So St. <laughs> Cross Fallacy says you shouldn't go up there, but you never know who you might meet. Uh, gentlemen over here. I think you mostly answered the question I was going to ask, which was... Oh, yes. Well, in that case... Yeah, the press is So the, the, um, the, um, the protests, in your opinion, try to analyse, you know, why is this happening and what, what's behind it. it. It's not so much that Hong Kong is to be some sort of perfect democracy or anything like we would be used to, but they have a credible fear that it could get worse than it is yeah. because of what China might impose if this extradition just the start of an overall Chinese-style harmonisation process, as they call it. Is, is that, Hong Kong has an interesting treaty with Australia. There weren't protesters in the street yeah. um, protesting that, that, right? So, um, so clearly, the, the China element was a huge factor in it all. But there will always be something. I mean, the national security law back in 2002, there will always be some decisions governments need to make. I mean, it's tax or otherwise. And, and it's a legitimate mm -hmm. reason for protesting. You know, the Hong Kong state. So, so it's, 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 a, it's, it's all part and parcel of. What's the demonym? No, 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 hang on. Why is that? I'll tell you. Okay. You get your follow up question over here. Okay. 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 So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. As I said, it's, a, um, it's an experiment. It's the first time we've done it. Uh, we're a free market think tank, which means we're really interested in what the members, uh, which occasionally we sort of the tongue calls the customers, think. So if you want to tell me what we got right and what we got wrong and how we could do it better and other ideas and who else we could get along to speak, etc., 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 please come and talk to me afterwards. Um, it's the first time we've done it, it obviously needs a little bit of adjustment. You need to mark it for dinner. <coughs> yeah, of course. And, and um, the other thing I do, which we need to do, which I've just been reminded, is that on the 2nd of October, we have our major fundraiser, which we call the McElraith Dinner, or McElraith Lecture. So Thomas McElraith... Wraith is probably a, a good word because he, he disappeared. He was a very prominent politician in 19th century Queensland. He was Premier twice. Um, he got Samuel Griffiths onto the High Court in what was essentially a dodgy deal. We'll go into that later. <laughs> um, made a huge difference to the place and he basically disappeared because that Samuel Griffith guy survived him and he died before Federation, even though he was one of the fathers of Federation, bust and back home in Scotland. So we've revived his name. He was a free trader, uh, like I think all of us are. Uh, and uh, 
each year we have a lecture and we ask someone to speak who's made a contrib contribution to Queensland in an entrepreneurial way, who comes from a free market point of view, individualistic point of view. Our first lecturer was John Wagner, because I saw that airport up there that they did in a year. Mm. And I said, that is amazing, that is a game changer up there. We've got to have that guy along. Our last lecturer was Sir Leo Hilscher. Now, he's a public servant, but Queensland wouldn't be what it is today if it wasn't for Leo. He invented the mining industry, and he did it without putting a dollar of real government money into it. Uh, this year, our um, lecturer is um, going to be um, Trevor St. Baker. Sorry, mental blank there. Trevor started off in the government sector. He's gone to the private sector. Most people don't know who he is. His, uh, private, uh, his public company, ERM, which is a electricity generator and retailer, is being taken over by a Malaysian company at the moment. Trevor has been spruiking for a new coal-fired power station. At the same time, he's got money invested in a battery charging system. He's got money invested in printed LEDs and printed photovoltaics. So he's across the whole spectrum of electricity. And if you look around us today at civilization, the economics has done so much, the technology has done far more. And when you talk about technology, you're really talking about electricity. And in my view, we're stuffing it up at the moment. Trevor's a guy who's making really good money out of this sector. He understands how it works. That's how he's making the money. He's not a rent seeker. He's an entrepreneur. It'll be a really great speech. It'll give you an idea as to where we're going. And it will introduce you to a great Australian who's, even though he's doing very innovative things, is in his 80s at the moment. Still going strong, but in his 80s. So uh, it's 165 bucks for the night. It's a two-course dinner with entree at 480 Queen Street, which is new state-of-the-art A-grade CBD building at the top end of Queen Street. And we're in the Grove, which is their Sky Garden. So you'll have fantastic views up there, um, and um, you'll get a great speech, and you'll get to meet more great people like the people that you're sitting next to today. So I encourage you to get on our site and book for that as well. And thank you very much, um, Richard, for the uh, the prompt. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you.